Well, hi there, and welcome once again to Olive Enrichment at Home. My name is Ken Beatty. I'm just one of the enrichment presenters aboard the Oceania fleet, and so proud to be so. Now, before I start, I just wanted to, to, to say uh, that I'm going back. I'm so excited. November is my first contract, so I'll be back sailing because it's been a year and a half or a little bit better than that since I've had the pleasure of meeting all the, you wonderful guests as well as my crew family and the shoreside people, which I just, well, we couldn't be anywhere without them. So anyway, I'm totally excited about coming back. Now, for those of you that, that uh, know me, I'm a horticulturist, botanist, a, a plant, geek, if you will. However, you know something, if you think about it, the relationships that, that peoples uh, have with plants has been around, well, it's still going. It's amazing stuff. I mean, plants of the world have contributed to and, and indeed affected global commerce. It's affected uh, religions, it's uh, spiritualities, all manner of things. Of course, food and uh, all of those things. So I like to talk about how we as a, as a human race and the plants, what, what we learn from the plants, what we use the plants for. So it's sort of an ethnobotanical, as you want to put a fancy word on it. But anyway, so that's basically my background and I've been doing it now for, oh my goodness, um, four, eight, seven, eight, nine, several decades, let's just put it that way. Anyway, so glad to be back. So let's get started. Today, I have three rather unusual plants that I'd like to share with you. Now, you don't have to be a plant aficionado. Like these things are wickedly cool. Now, the first one, <laughs> I've given it the common name as the Dr. Zeus plants because these are the weirdest looking creatures and I found them on the Canary Islands or Canary Islands, if you will. Um, the, the common name that, well, the common names are just that. They're different in Russia than they are in the US and they are in Ireland. Uh, they can be pretty much anything, but I think Dr. Zeus plant is probably the best thing for them. The, the proper name, the botanical name, the genus is Echium. Now, Echium grows in Australia, it grows in Europe, it grows in uh, North America as well. And I haven't seen specimens in South America, but it's very well known. This particular one, which you'll find uh, in Tenerife, La Palma, uh, at the Azores, of course, the west coast of Morocco, makes it so, for me, it makes it so weird. It's because the landscape on the Canary Islands are is quite, in, where they grow up in the mountains, is quite barren. So these wiggly wonky bits of business, that that's a botanical term, by the way, these wiggly wonky bits of business with their pink uh, pinkish flowers attracting all kinds of pollinators so, uh, look so strange, so strange. Now, useful to humans? No. They're deadly poisonous. Seeds, flowers, roots, not, not to touch, but to eat. Which begs the question, like, how did the early inhabitants of that island figure this out? Did they see one of the canoes, the dogs, uh, have a little bite and fall over, or did they feed a little bit to grandpa or grandma just to see what's going to happen? Now, the Canary Islands, uh, First of all, when I when I was a little guy, you know, can, Canary, Canary, Canary Islands. So of course I thought that's where the little yellow birds must come from, the Canary Islands. As it turns out, no, no, no. As I became a little bit more uh, in tune with the world, I've come to learn way back when that the early explorers who visited the islands originally, uh, there was dogs or dog-like creatures, a lot of them on the islands. So canus is from the Latin meaning dog. So Canary Island, Canary Islands, no birds whatsoever. So that's that particular plant. Now, sticking with that part of the world, um, there's a really unusual tree. If you get to Tenerife, for example, it's a thousand years old. And this isn't just a guess. I mean, they've carbon dated it. It's a thousand years old and it's a dragon blood tree or a draco. It's actually a, a dracaena. Very cool, very, very cool plant. Um, it, it grows to about, depending where you, where you see them, but about 20 meters or 60 feet tall. So that's no, no tiny little specimen, but it looks like an upside down, like an umbrella, like an upside down uh, plant. The roots are at the top, it looks like, and this big long skinny stem down to the bottom. So dragon's blood or Dracaena draco, Dracaena is the genus name for this particular is a native to this one, to the Canary Islands or the Canary Islands. And the early inhabitants had a great uses for it. They used the, the sap or the gum, that the exudate that came out of the stem to 
embalm their mummies. Now, as it turns out, the, the gum is actually very like amber. It gets hard or like, like um, toffee or caramel on top. So uh, the uh, anthropologists ha have a great time trying to figure out what in the world um, this particular mummy, it's, it's all hardened up. So they also used to uh, eat it to prevent scurvy. And you know, as it turns out, it's very high in vitamin C. Now, because this, this exudate or the, the gum that comes, out, that comes out of the tree um, resembles blood in, in not so much in consistency, but in color. So because of that, ooh, this is a ritual, this is very spiritual, there's something very spooky about this particular tree, the dragon's blood tree. So just the name itself is great. So it was used for ritual cleansing and incense and things like that. Now its first cousin, you'll find, uh, well, you don't actually get to stop in Socotra, but Socotra is a, an archipelago of uh, tinier spots, islands, just off the coast of Yemen. Uh, so that puts us in the Arabian Sea. Now, this particular uh, group of trees, it, it's Dracaena Draco as well, the dragon's blood. And it was used in all kinds of, uh, er, in the early days, particularly in medieval times for alchemy and uh, spooky businesses like that. But practically, it was used in, uh, in Italy, for example, as a varnish for the Stradivarius and, and you know, violins and musical instruments. And to this very day, it's still being used. So I, I, that's just so very, very cool. So um, whether you're a plant lover or not, uh, when you see these amazing trees, you'll go, my goodness, wow, that's super something. But you know, as I say, um, plants and, and peoples, plants and humanities and cultures have very strong ties and very strong connections. The next and final plant that I wanted to uh, let you know a little bit about, you've probably seen them before too, are the baobab trees. Now baobabs, uh, Madagascar has baobabs, there's I think, let me see, eight eight different species of baobabs around the world. You'll find them in Australia, you'll find them in Madagascar, uh, Western Africa, uh, up, up, uh, uh, sorry, Eastern Africa more so. Uh, beautiful, unusual looking trees. Um, <laughs> and not so much, um, the common names are kind of funny actually, as far as I'm concerned. Um, a monkey bread, which lets you think that, oh, maybe the monkeys actually do eat it, and they do. Uh, in Australia, now this is a bit, mm, okay, um, hanging dead rat or dead rat hanging because the fruit itself has a long stem, I guess resembling the rat's tail, and then this bulbous, um, like a small melon at, at the bottom. So, uh, you know, kind of a funny name for that. But it, they're pollinated by bats for the most part, and, and uh, because of that, that lets you know that the blossoms come out at night because bats typically are nocturnal. But what, what do people use these things for? And I must let you know too, that's still being used to this very day, not for this purpose. It was used as a burial ground in Western Africa uh, for a leper colony. I mean, these things are enormous, these the trunks, and they're hollow after a certain period of time. And well, they can actually hold 30,000 gallons of water. Amazing. I and mean, that's probably uh, one of the reasons, at least why these trees have been around since the dawn of very time. So a 2,000 years old is not uncommon for a baobab tree uh, at all. Now they're used for some pretty strange things like first of all the burial ground, but uh, some of the larger trees in East Africa, one of them's a bus stop, one of them's a little shop that sells different things, uh, you know, so and a house. There's a house in one of them too. So very unusual uses. Now, the, the local peoples in, in West Africa, for example, uh, Benin, they would use um, the fresh leaves when they come out, not old ones, fresh leaves, and they boil them up uh, in, a, in a, a liquor or a liqueur type of thing. And the, the sauce that, that is, comes out of that is very much like okra. It's kind of a sticky, gummy material, which is mixed with a porridge and on it goes. So it's been eaten for, for decades, or centuries actually, um, along the way. So it, it, it's kind of sticky and it's spiced up a little bit with local plants that you are pepper-like. Uh, and you know what? It's, it's very popular today as well uh, in the cosmetic industry. As well, it's extremely high 
in antioxidants. And as soon as we hear that, oh my gosh, it must be a good plant. So if you see baobab out on the, uh, in the markets or in the uh, health food stores in your part of the world, um, take a little try and see. So there you have a little bit, folks. That's three pretty interesting plants of some of the bazillions that we're going to see. And you know, I look incredibly forward to seeing you all again. You know, I just, I, I watched the the video of Marina for the, the launch back in the, in the Baltics, in Copenhagen, actually, you know what? It, I was very emotional. I saw my friends there. I saw, it was just amazing. So we'll all get together. We'll enjoy our company. Of course we will. And I'll see you next time right here on Old Life Enrichment at Home. Have a great day. Bye-bye.